I am inviting next speaker, Dr. Vijay Agarwal, uh, Senior Consultant Medical Oncologist, at uh, CG Enterprises, Bangalore, and uh, Chairperson, yeah, yeah, yes, and I'm not here. Now I am inviting chairpersons Dr. Atul Gupta, Consultant, uh, Department of Medical Oncology, Regency Hospital, Kanpur, and uh, Dr. Sandeep Bari, Radiation Oncologist, Regency Hospital, Kanpur. Thank you. Hello? Hello? Dr. Vijay Agarwal. Uh, is a med Dr. Vijay Agarwal is a senior consultant medical oncologist. He is from Bangalore. Uh, his qualification now, I am telling, he is a cert completed uh, certificate of completion of training, CCT medical uh, oncology uh, in uh, October 2012 from uh, General Medical Council, UK, and uh, he did PhD uh, in um, 212, Holy Art Medical College, UK, post-graduation diploma in uh, 2009 to 2011. Again, Holy Art Medical College, UK, post-graduation certificate in clinical education in uh, 2007 to 2008, Newcastle University, UK, and uh, MRCP in uh, July 2005 from UK, Doctor of Medicine in General Medicine in 1999 to 2012 from Manipal Academy of Higher Sciences, Manipal, India, and he did a Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery MBBS in 1993 to 1999 from Jawaharlal Nehru Medical College, Bangalore. Now he is senior consultant, medical oncologist, um, healthcare global enterprises from Bangalore. And uh, okay, he is very renowned person. Now I am inviting him. him the topic is genomics and cancer. Yes, thank you, sir. Dr. Sandeep and Dr. Atul and the organizers for asking me to come down here to give this talk on the uh, role of genomics in cancer. And usually, in my experience, the genomics in cancer is a post-lunch talk. You have a nice meal and try to fall off the sleep. Uh, but I've been given an hour in the morning session, uh, which I think is great. I'm going to talk a little bit about genomics, but more about how it is relevant in today's world, in treatment of cancer, uh, and, and how we're using this in day-to-day -day, uh, treatment of our, our patients who suffer from these problems. Before we go to the meat of the talk, that is looking at genomics and targeted therapy, let us look at the current problems uh, that are there, which is the incidence, the global cancer burden. When we look at this global cancer burden, there are currently 1.4 crore people. Uh, uh, this is 2012 WHO data for 1.4 crore people worldwide suffering from cancer. Unfortunately, more than 50% of them uh, would die from this disease. And the World Health Organization forecasts that this is going to rise over the next two decades to almost double the numbers. And the unfortunate part is that more than 80% of this increase in cancer deaths is going to be from developing countries like ours rather than the developed countries. So whether we like it or not, whether we believe it or not, believe it or not, we are currently in a cancer pandemic, in the middle of a cancer pandemic. And even if we do things today, such as anti-smoking, anti cutting down alcohol, and all the other things that can cause cancer, we start looking at controlling those uh, factors, the results will only be seen two decades later. So certainly in most of my practicing lifetime, I'm going to be seeing only increasing number of cancer patients, which is very, very unfortunate let alone be the world world data, but let's look at our Indian data, which is from the ICMR, that is Indian Council of Medical Research, which looked at the cancer prevalence in India. And as you can see, over the period since pretty much 2004, 
The cancer incidence, both in males and females, is on the rise and is predicted, they have predicted till year 2020, and it's going to continue to rise with no respite whatsoever. When we look at the main risk factors for cancer, I basically classify them into three major groups. One is lifestyle, the other is environment, and the third is inherited. Now, unfortunately, we can't do much about the inherited uh, cancers because it's just bad luck. We've been given those genes by our parents. It's been passed on from generations, and there's not much we can do apart from screening or the identification uh, from that. There's much, not much we can do sitting in this room about the environment either. It's for the uh, health policy makers, the government, uh, uh, to look at people sitting in the legislative assemblies and members of parliament to look at how to modify our environment around us. But lifestyle is a completely different picture. This is something each and every individual can do something about, either through self-control uh, self or through imparting of knowledge, uh, which, is, which is this. Clearly nothing speaks low, uh, louder than a celebrity smoking. When we look at, sorry, when we look at the lifestyle risks, the various lifestyle risks that are important in our day-to-day -day activities, clearly the center screen is tobacco and smoking. There is no doubt, and I don't think anyone in this audience would believe that smoking does not cause cancer. It is, there's plenty and plenty of evidence, and I'm not going to go through the, all the details of that uh, for the pressures of time, but there is no doubt that tobacco and smoking causes, uh, causes cancer. Apart from that, sedentary lifestyle, uh, increased fatty intake, obesity, alcohol, multiple sexual partners, increasing uh, processed uh, and red meat, all of these are high risk factors for cancer. Now, when we talk about cancer, I have lots of people who come up to me and say, uh, can plastic cause cancer? Does insecticides cause cancers? Well, if these things cause cancer, why should I stop smoking? They're carcinogens everywhere across the world. And that is why I really like like this slide, which is uh, from the World Health Organization, uh, looking at the various risk factors, the proportion of risk of each and every every lifestyle modifiable cancers. Okay? And there is nothing at all that comes in proportion to tobacco. Okay? Tobacco is right up here compared to any other risk factors. And these are important risk factors. I'm not talking about insecticides, pesticides, or, or plastics. Uh, but what I'm talking about is things like alcohol, low fruit and veg consumptions, obesity, physical inactivity, and infections such as human papilloma virus. So we take all of this into consideration. Clearly, tobacco is by and large the biggest cause of cancer. So can you say yes to all of this? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but it is something that you have to keep in mind. If you do want to reduce the risk of cancer, okay, you have to be be amongst this. It's only after you can abide by this, you can look at other minute causes of cancer, which is, am I within two kilos of my ideal body weight? Uh, can, do I exercise 30 minutes or more most days of the week? And uh, do I eat a healthy diet with five, at least five fruits or veggies uh, in, my, in my meal plans? And I don't use any tobacco in any form, and I have two or fewer alcoholic drinks per day. And if you can abide by these first, we can look at other other causes of causes of causes of cancer. When we come to treatment of cancer, uh, historically, uh, cancer treatment has always been based on chemotherapy, radiation, or surgery of some sort, or a combination of, of these, either two modality or tri modality treatment. And to demonstrate exactly that, which is we found a mass, and we do have evidence of mass destruction, and we can destroy the mass, but there will be collateral damage along with it. So coming back to the year 20th century, so going back to about 60, 70 years where cancer was, the main treatment for cancer was surgery. That is prior to the First World War. In the World War I, when nitrogen gas, mustard gas was used as a chemical warfare, what it caused was an aplastic anemia. It wiped out the, uh, the soldier's bone marrow. And two scientists, Lewis Goodman and Alfred Gilman, thought, well, if I can wipe out the bone marrow, why can't I use nitrogen mustard as a treatment for lymphomas? And they gave it to a few people with lymphomas. Well, it did work in a sense, it did, it did reduce the tumors, but unfortunately killed the patient as well. So it wasn't very useful at that point in time. But in 1947, something else happened. There's a guy called uh, uh, Sidney Farber from Boston, 
and he wanted to try drug treatment in children. And he was actually a pathologist, not an oncologist. Uh, because he was a pathologist, uh, he, when he looked at these leukemic cells under the microscope, what he saw was the, the cells were big, large blobs called megakarocytes, similar to what the RBCs looked like. Back then in the 40s, doctors in uh, uh, India, in Mumbai, were using folic acid to treat uh, um, uh, anemias uh, due, to vitamin, due to deficiency of folic acid. And he thought, well, if you look at how the anemia cells looked like, the megakarocytes, they look similar to what the leukemic cells looked like in kids. And he said, well, if you can use folic acid to treat anemia, why can't I use folic acid to treat leukemias? And uh, he gave uh, a few kids folic acid, and guess what happens? Uh, the disease progressed faster. The kids died much quicker than the natural, natural course of death would have been. He almost lost his license for that and pretty much branded as a bad researcher and no one should go near him and things like that. But he was, he was a scientist at his heart and he said, well, if folic acid increases the, the leukemic counts and induces death, can I not use an antifolate to reverse that? And he got hold of a drug called amnioctrin, uh, which was recently found, uh, which is actually a precursor of methotrexate, which we currently use in our day-to-day in -day practice. And he said, why don't I give amnioctrin to these kids and see what happens? And he gave it to about 26 kids. And it is a landmark paper uh, published in NEJM. If any of you get a chance to read it, please, please read it. It is a story on its own. It completely revolutionized treatment of leukemia. For the first time ever, people had seen a response with a drug to any particular cancer. Since then, chemotherapy has made history all across uh, the past century. Uh, uh, people have cured uh, germ cell tumors, leukemias, lymphomas with chemotherapy in various uh, combinations uh, uh, to speak of. However, when we continue to develop more and more chemotherapy, there are going to be more and more added toxicities. And the most advances has happened, not surely purely because of the chemotherapy, uh, but it's been our ability to deliver the chemotherapy that has been made very important, such as development of anti-nausea drugs, uh, such as ondansetron, which revolutionized how we could give uh, platinums, similarly growth factor stimulants to, to increase your body's immune system uh, uh, against, these, uh, against infections. So all of these have had a huge role to play in our ability to give multimodality treatment in a sense, combination chemotherapy of three or four drugs, which is what has resulted in a cure in a lot of cancers. And I'm talking about, not talking about early cancer, but I'm talking about late advanced cancers. However, Cancer treatment in the last century has been primarily based on histology, location, and size. Uh, not many, many treatments are available apart from a few chemotherapy drugs. There are three basic modalities of treatment, which is your radiation, chemotherapy, or surgery, and very limited supportive care options available. Now, whilst chemotherapy development was going at a very, very fast pace, there were some molecular developments happening. Now, a lot of the scientists knew what to look for. It's just that the technology was not there for them to move forward to identify things. Uh, but a few developments did happen in the past century. Uh, one is our ability to identify estrogen and testosterone, which stimulates the growth of both breast cancers and prostate cancers. And uh, in 1966, estrogen receptors were identified in the breast, uh, breast tissues, which would propagate breast cancers. We all know about the Watson and Crick discovery of, uh, of now 1953 about the structure of a, of a DNA. But more importantly, Stanley Cohen was the first person who identified a growth factor called the epidermal growth factor on the surface of cancer cells and hypothesized that maybe this is stimulating the cancer cells to grow uncontrollably. Okay. Apart from the factor, in 1978, almost 16 years later, the receptor for the growth factor was identified as well. And then the HER2 receptor, which is another growth factor receptor, identified in 1981. So, so these developments were slowly and steadily taking place because people were trying to understand what makes a cancer cells different from a normal cell. However, things changed dramatically in the year 2000. There were three important publications and news that came out. One is this, which looked at the hallmarks of cancer. The second thing was the Human Genome Project. And the third thing was a miracle pill. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about all of them, all of them uh, soon. One is, uh, Hananan and Weinberg published the first paper on, in the paper cell in the year 2000, looking at 
What is a hallmark of cancer? What do you call, how do you call a cell a cancerous cell? And it looked at various uh, uh, characteristics of these cells, such as sustaining proliferation, evading growth suppression, activating invasion and metastasis, and uh, replicative immortality, and also inducing angiogenesis so that they're able to grow and, and, and get food and move to other places, as well as resisting cell death. However, the same authors, about 10 years later, a decade later, said, well, that on its own does not characterize the cancer cells. And there are a few more things that are important, such as activating immune system, tumor promotion infl inflammation, genomics, as well as dysregulation. And all of these are also important, along with the others that they identified a decade earlier on. But why are we talking about genomics and cancer now? Well, why not before? Why not in the year 2000? In the year 2000, this lovely paper was published called the uh, Human Genome Project. That Human Genome Project took 10 years at the cost of three and a half billion dollars to clone one gene. So 10 years and three and a half billion dollars. None of us have that kind of money. Not even Steve Jobs would have that kind of money to clone his gene. More importantly, none of us would have 10 years if you have cancer to be able to identify that. Now, five years later, they cloned a chimpanzee gene for a mere $20 million, which is pittance compared to three and a half billion uh, in 2005. And in the year 2010, when Illumina came, brought out the MySig, we could clone a human gene in a month at the cost of $10,000. Now at HCG, uh, where I work, you could do it for about $500, and it takes two weeks to get the results. And hopefully one day, it will be like pregnancy tests. Okay, you get results in a day and you pay maybe $100 or $200 and get it done. So that is the speed of development of molecular science that has happened, that has enabled us to identify cancers, uh, identify genes, clone the genes, and identify uh, how that is different. So if you look at this, this particular graph, in the 1980s, when Sanger sequence, sequence was initially in, uh, invented in the University of Cambridge, they could do maybe 10 kilobytes per day of data analysis, and now you could do a billion kilobytes of data per day. And that is the difference that, this, uh, that the molecular development has happened and has transformed how this world. So hence, there has been a paradigm shift from histopathology to genomic analysis a lot, a lot, of, a lot of cancers. When you look at the clinical applications of genomics, uh, they are hereditary cancers. You can identify genes that run in families today uh, so that you can uh, uh, identify individuals or those who are at increased risk of developing cancers. You can identify gene expressions as prognostic or predictive biomarkers uh, whether a particular individual is likely to respond to therapy or likely to live longer if they have a particular gene signature as opposed to those who don't. And also molecular profiling for target therapy, which is actually the most important part of today's talk is how we can identify gene defects that exist in patients and how we can therapeutically manipulate by giving them the right drug. When we talk about gene sequencing, there are varieties of ways. It is literally reading off a, a restaurant menu as to which genes you want to be sequenced, what are the procedures that are required, whether you want a 48 gene panel, 150 gene panel, 300, whole genome, whole exome. There are varieties of options available and every company will sell you what they have. Uh, but that is not necessarily the important part or the most important thing to do. It is to identify what you're actually looking for. You should know what gene defects you're looking for before you go on a witch hunt. And the reason why we want to do that is because of our ability to develop, to deliver targeted therapy. And what do we actually mean by targeted therapy? Targeted therapy is basically a smart bomb versus a cluster bomb. So a smart bomb is a missile guided or radio guided which goes and, and, and follows its target and, and then this, and crushes this target without actually disturbing the, the neighborhood. But the cluster bomb not only destroys this target, but also destroys, uh, destroys everything else around it. Uh, because we, chemotherapy has toxicities, there's a huge rush to develop targeted therapies, uh, and, and one of them is a drug called imatinib. When imatinib first came out in the year 2000 for chronic myeloid leukemia, it was pretty much heralded as a, a miracle pill. And for the first time ever, maybe physicians or oncologists thought that there's a possibility that we might be able to cure cancer with just drugs. And this is what it did. 
We talk about chronic myeloid leukemia. Prior to the year 2000, this was the survival graph, the green one here. So a five-year survival was 63%, and that is after a bone marrow transplant. So prior to the year 2000, you ha if you had a successful bone marrow transplant, please don't forget the mortality from the bone marrow transplant 20 years ago was in the order of 15 to 20%. But if you survived that, you had a survival of about uh, 63%. And then comes along this miracle pill, a tablet called imatinib, and says, well, why don't you take a few tablets at home and stay at home, you don't need any transplants, and your survival is 93%. That was a fantastic outcome for the medical community. And if you look at chronic myeloid leukemia deaths, you're more likely to die from something else than of chronic myeloid leukemia at that point in time. So it was actually a miracle pill <coughs> at that point in time when it was uh, discovered, uh, discovered. Then came another drug called trastuzumab, uh, or uh, Herceptin, it's commonly known in breast cancer. And we saw similar amazing survival, survival from early breast cancer, shot up from the 70s to to just about 90%. However, <coughs> our love affair with uh, targeted therapy didn't last for very, very long. Another drug called Avastin was tried in breast cancer and failed miserably. There's absolutely no benefit in uh, overall survival or progression-free survival with Avastin in breast cancer. And the company almost went bankrupt before they identified its role in colon cancer. So, targeted therapy worked in some cancers but not in some cancers. And why is it? Okay. Why does target therapy not work in all cancers? That is because at that point in time, we were unable to identify or understand our target. So no matter how precise a rifle you have, if you want to blow up a ship, you can't do it with a rifle. So unless you understand what your target is, no matter how many ever design, drugs you design in the laboratory, it's actually going to be pointless and that is where genomic comes into existence. So I'm just going to get some water. So that is when genomics comes into this ability to identify targets. Hence, molecular profiling that can be done through varieties of ways, either through genomics, proteomics, which is a study of proteins, or metabolomics, which is a study of a cell respiration. Because we all know cancer cells respiration is different from a normal cell respiration. Based on these molecular profiling, whatever techniques we use, we can identify predictive or prognostic biomarkers and stratify patients such that the right patient gets the right drug at the right dose at the right time every time. And that is the holy grail of genomic medicine and, and molecular profiling. So when we look at a genomic landscape of about 5,000 cancer, uh, cancer cells that have been published in general of molecular diagnostics, in 2014. I'm not going to go through all of the details of it, but this is where all the cancers are, and this is where the molecular targets that are defective is. And you can pretty much identify which cancers, or which targets are likely to be defective, and design drugs, or certainly design clinical trials based on these defects. Let us look at breast cancer. Nothing has developed as rapidly as breast cancer. Now, unfortunately, breast cancer is one of the commonest cancers in women. Uh, Western data, 1 in 8 women will get breast cancer. Indian data, 1 in 15 women will get breast cancer. So if there are 100 women in this room, rest assured, about 15 of them are likely to develop breast cancer in their lifetime. And that is a very, very scary picture. Okay. However, there's been absolutely amazing developments in our ability to treat breast cancer patients. Our development of a drug called EGFR2 or HER2, uh, which we discussed earlier was, was identified in the 90s. Okay. We have drugs designed against HER2 drugs. Also, there are intracellular signaling pathways that we can therapeutically manipulate, such as mTOR inhibitors, as well as CDK4 and 6 inhibitors. So these are drugs that are currently used in clinical practice, which is changing the lives of our cancer patients every, every day. Let me give you an example of a patient with colon cancer. Now, this patient had metastatic colon cancer with the cancer that has already spread, spread to the liver. Now, if you can look at the CT scan, this is the liver. And this is all the tumors there. We gave this drug, of, this patient a particular drug called panitunumab, which is targeted against the epidermal growth factor receptor. Now, uh, within six weeks, it's virtually gone, except for the smile's tiny bit there. And the best response is in three months, where it's pretty much a complete response, complete radiological response. 
We could never imagine to get that kind of response from chemotherapy. But the targeted therapy can do that for us. Okay? Unfortunately, it does that only in 15% of the people. Okay? And that drug costs approximately 3 to 4 lakhs a month. If I were to give it to all 100 people, I would be doing complete injustice to my patients. But in 85 of them it won't work, but in 15 it would. But now I have the capacity Okay, are the molecular diagnostics or genomic testing to identify who are those 15 people who are going to respond? And that is these, these, these people in the pink. The rest of them are not going to respond. Okay, so I can do genomic testing such as KRAS, NRAS, and VRAF in our laboratory, in our genomics laboratory. Within a matter of a week, 10 days, I'll be able to identify whether you're going to respond to this particular drug or not. And save 85 patients out of the 100 the side effects of this drug and the financial toxicity that comes with it. Let us look at an example of another example of lung cancer. Now, historically, uh, lung cancer was pretty much one, and in the 90s they divided them into whether it's a squamous carcinoma or an adenocarcinoma, which the pathologist would look under the microscope and, and tell tell me, well, it looks like an adenocarcinoma, it looks like a squamous carcinoma. Well, as a clinician, it didn't make much of a difference to me. I still gave them a platinum doublet chemotherapy which was take a pick, just flat in, combine it with something else, benarobin, gemcitabine, uh, paclitaxel, it doesn't matter. The outcomes were still miserable, median uh, response rates about 20-25%, progression fee survival about 6 months, and overall survival about 9 months. And that is what all the patients with lung cancer had. However, things have changed dramatically today. We'll now we're able to molecularly profile these lung cancer patients, resulting in something like this. So this is history. This is what we're doing today. Okay, we're molecularly profiling them based on EGFR status, RAS status, uh, ALK status, RAW status, and so forth. I can go on and on, and HER2 status and things like that. Let's forget, forget each and every one. Let's, let's take this EGFR. On EGFR itself, I have an exon 19 deletion, exon 21 mutation, T7, 90 mutation. And why is that important? Because for each one of them, I have a different drug. I give a fatinib for this, a lotinib for this, and osimotinib for this. That is the specific targets that we are able to identify and give them specific drugs. Resultant outcome, progression free survival in the order of about, about, about 20 months, median overall survival in the order of about 36 months. And response rates about 75 to 80%. And that is the difference molecular profiling and genomic studies can, can, can do. This is a patient with lung cancer who had an EGFR due to mutated lung cancer. You can see all this disease, disease there, the pleural effusion there, and you give them Jeftinib, post two months of Jeftinib, virtually complete response. So this is how our patients are benefiting from being able to identify genomic defects so that we can give them appropriate treatment. So even though the incidence of cancer is continuously rising, the mortality from cancer is actually dropping significantly pretty much since the year 2000 at a drastic, drastic stage. That's a drastic rate. Now, this is a fantastic paper published in 2015, and I can't emphasize this enough. Uh, but this is one of my favorite studies, the first favorite meta-analysis, which looked at about 32,000 patients. You can't beat that. A 32,000 patient meta-analysis of over 570 trials. And what they looked at, they did a pool analysis and looked at if you give them standard chemotherapy versus personalized therapy based on their genomic uh, defects, what was the outcome? And if you look at response rates, much better compared to non-personalized. You look at progression-free survival, significantly better compared to non-personalized, and overall survival, significantly better compared to non-personalized. All of them statistically significant. There is very little doubt in my mind, I'm sure most of the oncologists' mind who manage this on a day-to-day -day basis, that precision medicine, based on genomic defects, is here to stay and is likely the future of oncology. Uh, however, you could call it a miracle drug. I mean, imagine it was heralded a miracle drug. We've not had another drug for a long time now, but clearly it will be a miracle if you can afford to pay for it because some of this can be ridiculously expensive, as much as 3 to 4 lakhs uh, a month. However, having said that, not all targeted therapies are expensive. So uh, I work in a hospital called Healthcare Global, which is a cancer hospital, and we have an approach to move away from population medicine towards personalized treatment. All patients are given the option of undergoing genomic testing, which we have our own in-house laboratory where we do these testings, both molecular diagnostics and genomics. We have our own Illumina MySig, 
in which we do that, we incorporate technology in our day-to-day -day practice, such as genomics, liquid biopsies we'll discuss a little bit about later, and cast I'm going to omit uh, for today's talk. The, the role of, the, of this is to identify the right drug or the right drug combinations using molecular diagnostics to improve outcomes and also reduce toxicities as well. So our genomic structure uh, setup is called the Center of Genomics and Translational Research. It is, uh, I mean, if you guys come to Bangalore, please, please drop by. I'll be happy to show you around. We have a state-of-art genomic uh, diagnostic setup as well as genetic counselors to counsel our, our patients. And we use genomic medicine on a day-to-day -day, uh, uh, practice to improve patient outcomes. We also have molecular tumor board, which happens once a week, where all patients uh, are discussed uh, who, have who have genomic defects to identify what accurate treatments uh, to offer them. Uh, the varieties of types of genomic capabilities that we can do in-house, most of them are mutation testing. We have 48 and 151 gene panels. To reduce the cost, we've also come up with something which is very innovative, which is looking at specific cancer panels such as breast, lung, colorectal, head and neck, because the cost of that is pretty much the same as uh, immunization chemistry, it is pretty cheap. We also look at germline mutation testing, uh, such as uh, uh, to identify genes that run into the families. Uh, so this is some of our own in-house data, which I thought I'll share with you. Uh, we've counseled about 1,800 patients. Of, of this, 1,000 patients have been identified, have been tested. And the important thing about that is, is, is this. I mean, if you look at uh, this one, most of our patients are breast, uh, followed by colorectal and gynae and lung as well. But the most important part is, is this slide, where of all the, of the 1,000 patients that we have screened, about 45 of them, 45% of them, we've identified genomic defects that we could therapeutically manipulate. And that is a huge number, a huge number of patients. 45% of those patients we can therapeutically manipulate. And another 35% of the patients, we were able to get prognostic indicators such as are they going to be better or are they not going to do better and so forth. So by and large, in the vast majority of our patients, genomic testing always helps, always helps. This is our data for germline mutation testing, uh, which we looked at 250 patients, and we identified that most common mutations were either the BRCA's or BRCA1 or the BRCA2, which is common, which commonly causes breast cancers and, and ovarian cancers, uh, as well as prostate cancers in men, uh, and 47 percent of them constituted the, the rest of the patients. And genomic testing is important, and that's pretty much how we've evolved uh, from our own experiences over the past, past uh, five or seven years or so. So when we take at lung cancer, there's certain defects that we know exist in lung cancers, such as EGFR, ALK, ROS, MET, and so forth. And historically, what we've always been doing is we've been doing reflex testing. So we do an EGFR testing. If that comes negative, look at ALK. And if that becomes negative, we look at ROS. It takes about a month to get through each one of them. There's a lot of time and money wasted. But now we have a multi-gene panel. So we request all of them together along with the genomic paneling. Okay. We get the results within a few weeks, uh, 10 days, uh, 10 days to, uh, to two weeks. And uh, patients are pretty much started on a treatment, treatment straight away. And it's not much more expensive because of our lung cancer panels. I'm going to skip this slide. But this is what I mean meant by reflex testing. You have an EGFR, ALK and ROS, and then you do a full panel. And we can pretty much avoid all of that by doing them uh, all at once uh, uh, using next generation uh, sequencing. Let me give you some, uh, some examples of how we've, uh, individual examples, because we're likely to relate more to that than the data of 30s of thousands of patients. So we had a patient with a 32-year-old man who's a non-smoker, uh, presented with, with cough and shortness of breath, was found to have lung cancer, a type of lung cancer called adenocarcinoma. And we did molecular profiling for this patient. Uh, we did the standard reflex molecular profiling, which was EGFR mutation, which is negative, ALK mutation, ALK re uh, rearrangement, which is negative, uh, Roche uh, 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 mutation, which is also negative. Uh, so patient was given standard chemotherapy, and the patient's progressed on chemotherapy, was given another line of chemotherapy, for which also he progressed. So basically he was chemotherapy resistant, and he was not responding to any chemotherapy. So we decided to do a whole genomic panel, a 48 gene panel. And what we found was a mutation in another gene called HER2, which is commonly found in, uh, found in breast, breast cancer patients. And because we could identify this, this gene defect in this patient by doing a multi-gene panel, we put this patient on a drug called afatinib, which is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, specific uh, for, for HER2, because it is a, it is a pan HER2 inhibitor. And the patient remained, remained on this drug with uh, progression-free survival for about 10 months, which is a fast, fantastic re result 
for lung cancer patient who was chemo refractory and probably had a survival with brain meds of less than three months. Uh, let's let me give you another example of a, of a 40 year old uh, patient uh, who presented with the adenocarcinoma of the colon and had liver meds at the time of presentation. Also had a family history of, of similar cancers. Uh, similarly underwent molecular profiling for KRAS, was found to be wild type. Essentially, when you have a KRAS wild type, you can be given a particular drug uh, called cetuximab. And the patient was commenced on this particular drug along with chemotherapy, but pretty much progressed straight away and had absolutely no benefit from it. Now, in our setup, what we do is we don't do a single gene, we do a multi-gene paneling, and which is what we did for this patient. And what we found was that the patient had, the KRAS was wild type, but the patient had mutation in the NRAS gene which can also induce resistance to those particular drugs that patient was receiving. Uh, hence, it is always important to expand your horizon and not look at individual markers uh, to try to save cost, but look at multi -paneling. The drug that he got, Cetuximab, cost about one lakh a week. Okay, com compare that to a 20, 25,000 rupee testing, it is peanuts. Okay, so there's a lot of money saved, a lot of such side effects and uh, outcome as well. Uh, this patient was also found to have Lynch syndrome because of a family history of disease and we did some genomic testing. So that would probably have some implication in further treatments such as immunotherapy or to the rest of his family. Um, this patient was actually commenced on Folfox with uh, Bevaciximab, which is a different, which is a VEGF inhibitor, uh, which uh, KRAS or uh, NRAS has no effect on, and the patient continues to... testing uh, and uh, doing multi-gene testing always helps. The clinical utility of the test results is actually very, very important. And what is important is the type of testing you do. A lot of patients, a lot of companies do offer you a whole genome sequencing, a whole exome sequencing, and pretty much by doing that test, they, they offer you immortality. But that is far from the truth because you get a lot of junk data from it, which you have absolutely no idea how to analyze, analyze this. And plus, there's absolutely no point in doing uh, molecular testing for those drugs that are not approved or available in India, such as BRAF, BRAF mutation in melanomas. Uh, the, the drugs are very, very effective, but they're particularly, they're not available in India, so we can't actually use them. Turnaround time is also equally important. Uh, if you have cancer patients, you're not going to make them wait for one or two months. So the test takes very long to, uh, to do. There's absolutely no point in, in doing them. One of the biggest problem we have is that despite these drugs being FDA approved, plenty of evidence being shown around, the insurance companies have refused to cover these costs under the insurance uh, portfolios. And that is one of the biggest problems we are currently facing. The insurance companies will not pay out for these drugs. And a lot of times these patients have to pay out, uh, pay out for, for these drugs from their own, own pocket. The other issue, biggest issue is tissue availability and repeat biopsies. Now when we talk about precision oncology, genomic oncology, personalized medicine, whichever terminology you use, uh, there are various hallmarks when you try to understand how these drugs work or how this drug is effective in a particular patient. Uh, so the most important thing is to identify the target, which is your, your target confirmation. Okay? Does this patient have a target for this drug? So, so if someone comes with a breast cancer, do they have an HER2 application so that I can use Hercept in these patients? Okay, let us say you identify, okay, you do a biopsy and you look at it under the microscope or you do a molecular profile and you identify a target. Now, if I give a drug, is it inhibiting the target is the next question. For that, you probably need another biopsy in a few weeks' time. Okay. And the third thing is the bi biological effect of the target. Okay. Is it actually having an effect or not effect? Okay. Is, is, the, is the patient actually responding to that particular treatment or not? And the fourth thing is that, will the patient subsequently develop resistance to this drug? And the only way to know proactively is to take repeated biopsies. Now, clearly, no sane patient will let you biopsy them every two to three weeks. It's an invasive procedure, it is a painful procedure, and there's absolutely no way they're going to do that. However, when you look at pre-treatment biopsies, on-treatment biopsies, and resistance tracking biopsies, there's another alternative called liquid biopsies. Okay. We could do, we have now the technology to do liquid biopsies and this technology is available in my hospital in-house. So we have our own dropper digital PCR through which we do liquid biopsies, liquid biopsy analysis. So what liquid biopsy essentially means is taking a bodily fluid, most commonly a blood sample, 
Because in these blood samples, the cancer DNA called cell-free DNA are shed into. And we have the technology to extract those DNAs and study them in the laboratory. Okay? We amplify them through proper digital PCR and the next generation sequencing and aluminumisic to identify mutations that exist. And the clinical applications for liquid biopsy is huge. Okay? Right from diagnosis, it helps us give us a diagnosis, right from taking a blood sample, rather than doing an invasive biopsy, to understanding prognosis, to analyze the mutation. Not just the type of mutation, but also the mutational burden. It's so how much of the mutational burden that exists. Helps in drug selection, so you can identify the right drugs for the patient. Drug developments. It also helps in tracking treatment effectiveness. For example, you have a mutation of a, of a KRAS, and you have, say, a hundredfold mutation, and you give them some drugs, and they take another blood sample in two weeks' time, and that hundredfold mutation drops to thirtyfold mutation. You know your drugs are effective. Also helps in resistance tracking. Okay. Now we know, let us say for example, you have a patient with an EGFR mutated lung cancer and you're giving them some targeted therapies. They can subsequently develop another mutation called T790 mutation that will make the previous target ineffective, inducing resistance. Now what do we do? We wait for the resistance to happen. We wait for the treatment for the uh, patient to progress radiologically. Then we identify that the patient has unfortunately progressed and then we change treatment. But we don't have to do that anymore. We can proactively track resistance by doing this blood test on pretty much on a monthly basis. So the future of uh, cancer, uh, cancer biopsy is pretty much moving from tissue biopsy to liquid biopsies. One of the most bizarre things uh, which we do every day, which I do in my practice as well, is that when the patient comes to me, I take a biopsy, a tissue biopsy, and I do molecular profiling and all those fancy things that I've explained to you of what I do. But I treat that patient for the rest of their life based on that one biopsy and one molecular profiling. Knowing fully well that any treatment I give or the natural course of the disease, the molecular profile of the cancer cells is going to change. There is going to be heterogeneity in the body. But I conveniently ignore that because doing biopsies is difficult. Doing biopsies is painful, and our patients won't accept it. But now I don't have to do that anymore. I can do liquid biopsies. I pretty much move from static mutations to dynamic genomic analysis. Okay. Um, also, moving from clinically to molecular response. We already do that in leukemias nowadays. We look for cytogenetic response, but not so much in solid tumors. But we, there's no reason why we can't, uh, can't do that. The fact that now we have uh, liquid biopsies, and we can look at the mutational burden. I already discussed a little bit about reactive to proactive resistance monitoring as well. And the other important thing is to identify late from early relapse. Now what happens is, when the patient, you've treated the patient uh, using whatever treatment modality you have, patient is on follow-up, and we just do three monthly scans and wait for the disease to get worse before we start the next modality of the treatment. But by then, the disease burden has already increased. It's probably a, bit, a little bit too late. Uh, but with doing liquid biopsies and assessing molecular response, we can actually track early, early relapse. It's a different question whether you, whether you start treatment with an early relapse is going to have an effect on outcome or not. Uh, is a different question which we have to do studies to prove otherwise. Uh, so we currently have liquid biopsies in our hospital. Uh, we do genotyping, genotyping for lung cancers, colorectal cancers, uh, breast cancers and melanomas. Uh, we also use that for minimal residual disease assessment as well as resistance tracking. The technology we use is dropper digital PCR and, and the NGS based approach is, is targeted deep sequencing. So coming pretty much towards the end of my talk, just a few more slides to go. Since the landmark papers of 2000, which is the hallmarks of cancer, uh, the nature paper on the human genome project and the identification of imatinib, what has changed in the past 17 years? But not that much really. Uh, we've had about 12 or 13 targets that are currently approved for treatment in our day-to-day -day practice. So all of these targets uh, in these types of cancers, we currently use a therapeutic manipulate, which has shown absolutely amazing results, and our patients are living uh, forever. However, there are certain drawbacks. Uh, the data is still limited for all of these targeted therapies, and maybe to a certain extent, clinicians are racing ahead of science. That whatever little smaller result we get, we are kind of introducing it in our practice. 
What we don't affect, uh, don't understand, is probably class-related acute toxicities, and how that will have an impact in the future. For example, I've given a particular patient a drug called Cetuximab, for example. It's been in the market only for about 10 years. What I don't know is that what is the drug going to do in 20 years' time, in 30 years' time? I don't have that follow-up data. We know a particular drug called Herceptin, the trastuzumab that we use for breast cancers, can cause cardiotoxicity, even 10, 15 years later. Follow-up we have. We don't, I don't have a 30 or 40 year follow-up. So I can't assure my patients that the long-term side effects are not there. Other things that we don't understand is mechanism of resistance. We know that cancer cells eventually develop resistance to these drugs. But how do they do it? And how we can therapeutically avoid or manipulate them is something that we don't know. However, as a medical community, uh, we can be extremely proud of some of the remarkable successes that we have, uh, in particular these types of cancers, which is the leukemias and GIST, or melanomas, renal cell carcinomas, lung cancers, thyroid cancers, breast cancers, colon cancers. In these diseases, we have transformed how we manage patients because of targeted therapy over the past 10 to 15 years. Most of these patients had an immediate survival of less than 12 months and are now living forever. Uh, there are a lot, of, a lot of studies that have been currently ongoing. A lot of these targets are currently being analyzed. Some of them have been approved uh, because if you look at the FDA approval in, of drugs in cancer, uh, you see these uh, blue bars. Pretty much most of this has happened in the past five years or so uh, compared to chemotherapy before, with very few new chemotherapy drugs coming into the market nowadays. Um, so target therapy is the future, is here to stay, uh, and is most likely going to change as more and more research uh, goes on of how our patients live. Thank you very much. We must have some genomic card. Everybody should have. So we can uh, relate. When we are going to the doctor, we have some disease, some cold and cough. Then doctor will ask, do you have any um, genomic card? Yes. If you have, then you come. If you don't have, you now go. And first collect genomic card. So thank you, Dr. Agrawal. And now I am inviting uh, our uh, chairpersons. Dr. Atul Gupta and Sandeep Barik to say something and ask any question. Uh, Dr. Agrawal, I must lecture. Thank you for that. I just had one query that uh, targeted agents, they are showing very good results in the metastatic setting. So why most of the targeted agents, they fail to show any response in the adjuvant setting? Yeah. I mean, see, uh, Having said that, I mean, Herceptin is currently used in the adjuvant setting and has shown a good, good survival. See, there are two things here. One is, most targeted therapy are not, not cytotoxic, they are anti proliferative So they prevent growth rather than, uh, rather than actually kill the cancer cells. Uh, in due course, clearly by nature of it, cancer cells are cells that continue to multiply. And there's only one function for that cancer cell is to multiply. And if it doesn't multiply, and it can't multiply, it will eventually die. Um, but when you talk about early cancers, what we're talking about is removal of the primary. We're not dealing with metastatic disease. The mainstay of treatment is still surgery. And, and by and large in most of the cancers. A lot of the clinical trials are actually going on. Uh, for example, panitinimab in, in colon cancer. The cetuximab didn't show any, very, any, any uh, survival benefit. But most of these drugs actually start in a metastatic setting and slowly over a period of time try to filter it into the adjuvant setting. Okay. So Herceptin is already filtered into the adjuvant setting. Most of the imatinib is there in, in adjuvant setting for GEST, for example. We use three years. There's probably some data of serafinib in, in renal cell carcinomas, though that's controversial. So things are slowly filtering in. And I think only time will tell whether this becomes the standard of care. But I think we just have to give it some, give it some time. But I take your point that most of these drugs are still proven in the metastatic setting, uh, purely because of the nature of it. And, and secondly, because I think it's just not filtered in, into that stage yet. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vijay, for uh, enlightening us, and it's a wonderful presentation. Uh, I would like to uh, ask you, like, uh, here uh, in UP, we are uh, unfortunately having one of the highest load in head and neck cancer in uh, entire country. So is 
the liquid biopsy would be a future like uh, in our clinics we see a lot of young patients like below 35 they are coming with head and neck cancers so can there be a uh, liquid screening uh, act as a screening for uh, usefulness of these patients so i mean uh, the, the short answer is no okay um, because currently liquid biopsy is not there to identify cancers it is there for molecular profiling so it does not result in diagnosis Okay. So, if you want to use liquid biopsy as screening to identify if the particular patient has that particular cancer, that does not exist. Because for that to exist, what, what we do with liquid biopsy is we take the tumors, uh, the cell-free DNA, we extract the cell-free DNA, and we look for mutations. So, we are presuming that 100% of head and neck cancers will have mutation. Okay. I mean, the, the highest incidence of any particular mutation is KRAS mutation in 90% of pancreatic cancer patients. But by and large, most of them, some may have mutation, some may not have mutation. Uh, Unfortunately, in head and neck cancer, what's up? the mutational load is very, very high, but not of any specific mutation. So P53 mutation is very, very common. But if you get head and neck cancer, or for example, oral cancer from HPV virus, then you have a P53 downregulation, not necessarily mutation. And we will not be able to identify the downregulation part of it, though we can identify mutation. So uh, I don't think so it's going to happen. I don't even think the future is that. I, we are, there is no technology that currently exists Though companies will try to sell you that, that you do a blood test and we can tell you whether you have cancer or not. That's just a myth. And there's absolutely no test that can do that for you. And that is for any type of cancer. Thank you. Okay, for all the students and the guests which are coming from the different states, thank you. Now you can ask any questions to my doctor, Dr. Vijay. Thank you. Socio-economic and political impact of cancer. Major General Dr. Subhash Chand Parikh is the speaker. Dr. Rahul Misra is program director and Dr. Abad Dube and Dr. S.K. Misra are chairpersons. I invite Dr. Rahul Misra to conduct the session.